welcome to ever-increasing faith. Remember these words from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Praise God for another day and for another privilege and opportunity to share with you the living word of God. Let's turn in our Bibles, if you please, to the book of Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We're going to begin a new series today. And we're going to start out in the book of Romans. Now, for the benefit of those of you that are watching by television, I want to give you the same opportunity that was afforded those here in the congregation earlier, and that is, in your case, the opportunity of sending your tithes, offerings, and gifts of love for the financial support of ever-increasing faith television. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, I need your continued faithful financial support if Ever Increasing Faith Television is to remain on the air in your area. I need your help. I won't tell you how much to give. All I'd ask you to do is to measure the value of the ministry to you. If it is valuable and you think it's worthwhile and that it ought to stay on the air, then you support it to the extent of its value to you and to the extent of your capability. On the screen is an address where you can mail your gift of love for the support of the ministry. And also right now, I want to pray for you and pray with you. I simply want to add my faith to your faith and set myself in agreement with you that you're going to receive the corresponding return on your giving because as you give, you're operating in a biblical principle called sowing and reaping. And as you sow, you should expect to receive a harvest. And I would let you know that this is good ground in which to plant. So you should be getting a harvest. So if you'll join me now, let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this time of fellowship together through the television ministry, and we thank you for the privilege and opportunity to give our tithes, offerings, and gifts of love for the support of ever-increasing faith television. We thank you that in this covenant dispensation of grace, you have provided for us the great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, who ever lives in the holy sanctuary of heaven to make intercession on our behalf. And dear Jesus, as our high priest and as our the one that receives and gives to the Father, we're asking you now to take the tithes, the offerings, and gifts of love sent by the people for the support of this ministry before the Father and worship him with them on our behalf. We thank you for that. And now, Father, as pastor of Crenshaw Christian Center Church here locally and as pastor of Ever Increasing Faith Television for many thousands who are watching me now, I set myself in agreement with each and every one of them that they will receive the corresponding return on their giving and that all their needs are met according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. For this we thank you and praise you in Jesus' mighty name. And all who agreed with that prayer said, Amen. Thank you very much for your continued and faithful financial support of ever-increasing faith television. You are helping to make it happen. Let me also remind you and inform some that this television ministry was never designed to be a substitute for actually showing up in a Sunday morning church service and be in fellowship with others of like precious faith. If you haven't found a church yet in your area, I can understand that the television ministry would then take its place. But at all costs, seek to find a church. Now understand, one that gives you the word, one that's going to allow you to grow and come into knowledge of the things of God so that you can walk in your covenant privileges. And so if you haven't found a church, then ever-increasing faith can be a bridge over those waters, as it were. But if you have a church that you could go to and receive the word, you need to be in fellowship. You need a sense of responsibility of belonging to something and being accountable to a local church. And then also, we well, I might, just well take, might as well take this time. I really don't care where you're from or what your background is. We also want you to know it doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. We want you to know you'd be welcome here in this church, okay? Just want you to know there is a place. You may say, well, I can't find a place. Well, this is one. At least check us out and give us a shot at it, okay? Praise the Lord. We'll see you here. All right. Now, the reason that I asked the question that I did a while ago is because I was impressed as I was meditating about the message since we'd finished up on what God hates. And I thought about it, and I was quickened that it's time in certain areas for me to go back and do some things that all the new people have never been exposed to. 
Then on top of that, some of the old folk, and I don't mean that age-wise, but some of the ones that have been here a while, uh, it looks like in looking at some of the lifestyles of the not-so-rich and famous, <laughs> that uh, they still, even though having been exposed to it, probably got inoculated so that they can't catch the word. They've just been exposed enough, got enough of it to make them dangerous. And so they're not really living in it yet, so it's always good to review, to go back over. So I looked at, began to deal with what, what I be believe the Lord wanted me to deal with, and I haven't dealt with this subject since 1984 in a congregational setting, so I think it's about time. And then, as I said, well, that's why I wanted to find out how many people have come since then. You never have heard this, not in this setting and not in this context. So I'm impressed to go this way. Praise the Lord. So, what we're going to talk about starting today, and I don't know how long this will take me, and besides, you see, over the years you grow. I've grown. I've learned a lot of things. I've gotten a lot of, you know, it's not like the truth is new, but is, it is the expansion of that truth, the being able to see the truth in a fuller dimension, and even more experiences that, that I've had over those years since that time, which is like nine years, I've grown, I've reached a higher plateau. I know some other things. I know other ways to say what I said nine years ago that I think will help to lift you up to a higher level and, of course, inform our new people. So what we want to talk about is how faith works. Okay? How faith works. Now, before you get upset some and say, oh, I already heard that, I'll guarantee you. Now, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm saying this facetiously, and I don't mean this, but I just do it just to sort of, you know, loosen everybody up so I don't want anybody to get super spiritual on me. But I will, I will wager I don't gamble, okay? Don't believe in gambling. <laughs> Okay, so you understand how I'm saying this. But I will wager that if you listen carefully, even though you may have heard this series nine years ago or whenever you heard it, I'll guarantee you, even this very day, you will hear something you never heard before. You will gain some knowledge that will add to what you already have that will make you a better winner. Okay? And then, of course, like I say, for our other friends and new members that have never even heard it, that's how this faith don't got here is by faith. That's how, we, that's how this building was here when you came. That's how this ministry was here, because of learning to walk by the principles of the Word of God. So how faith works. Now, the first thing that I want to do is to establish the importance of faith. I'll say right at the very outset that in my personal opinion, I am firmly convinced that the most important subject to any born-again Christian, once they get born again, once they accept Christ as their Savior, once they become a part of the household of God, at that point in time, the most important thing for them to learn and know is how to walk by faith. There is nothing else that is more important than faith. You cannot tell me anything that's more important than faith. Because if you think you know of something, I'll show you that faith is more important than that. Now, I don't mean more important to the exclusion and the dismissal of other things as though they were not important, but I'm talking about priority. I'm talking about number one that goes before number two, that goes before number three, that goes, be, you know, sequence. Yeah. So faith is the most important thing. In fact, let's see if you can stump Pastor Price. And you might be able to do it, because I don't know everything, and I'm really going out on a limb on this. But I tell you what you do. You think of something that you feel is more important than faith. Once you become a Christian, and just tell me, and then let's see if I can, let's see if I can show you that faith is more important than that. 
any subject, anything. Love. Did somebody say love? You said love? All right. Let me show you faith is more important than love. Now, not, not, now understand what I said. Now, I, did not, I didn't say more important, more important than the ex- clu- exclusion of anything else, but in terms of priority. Priority means what comes first, what comes second, what comes third, okay? So I say that faith is the most important subject that any Christian needs to know about, understand, master, and learn how to live by. It's more important than anything else in the kingdom of God. Now, let me show you why. You said love. Somebody else said love. Was that somebody that said love back here, that loud holler that I heard? All right, let me show you that faith is more important than love. Let me show you that faith is more important than love. Not more important, again, in the sense that faith takes the place of love. I said in priority order. You need to learn about faith before you need to learn about love. And the reason for it is, is because you're going to have to learn how to love people by faith. And if you don't have any faith and know how to operate in it, you're not going to be able to love. Now, I know what you might say. You might say, ah, Brother Price, I disagree with that because it's very clearly revealed in in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, at the very last part of the 13th chapter, it says that now abideth faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, that would look like that what I just got through saying contradicted the Scripture. But you need to understand what you're reading. See, the problem is what you've done and what people have done is taken that last verse out of 1 Corinthians 13 and just extracted it from its setting and pulled it out here and used it as a principle. Love is more important than anything else. That's not what Paul was writing about. See, you have to read chapter 12 and chapter 14. And there were problems in the church at Corinth in terms of the people not understanding fully how to operate in the things of the Spirit. And so there was confusion. There was misunderstanding. And therefore, the body at Corinth was not being edified as it could have been edified if they had understood how to do it. So Paul inserted 1 Corinthians 13 right between 12 and 14 to show the people that in order to operate in chapter 12 and in order to operate in chapter 14, they should do it out of a motive of love. Love is the greatest motive as to why you do something. There is no greater motivator than love. In other words, I ought to serve God because I love him. I ought to pay my tithe because I love God. I ought to live right because I love God. I ought to read the word, study the word, and pray because of a motive of love. I ought to give to my brothers and give to my sisters. I ought to lay hands on the sick because I love. Not lay hands on the sick to show how powerful a man of faith I am to be able to get the man healed and then stand back and gloat about, oh, look at me. Ain't I something? I got this man healed. I ought to be ministering to him out of a motive of love. The reason that I'm doing it is because I'm moved by love. Do you understand that? And that's what Paul was talking about. And when it comes to the motivator, now abides faith, hope, love. The greatest motivator is love. I ought not be motivated just because I have faith. I ought to do it because I have love. Do you understand that? So that's what he's talking about in chapter 13. That's why he says, Now abides faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. It is as the motivator. It's it's better than, greater than faith. I have faith, but I ought to have love more than faith as the reason why I do what I do. How many of you understand that? Can you understand that now? You see what I'm talking about? So it's not a contradiction. What I had said about faith being the most important subject once a person gets born again is is not out of line. Now, I know that in Galatians it talks about that faith worketh by love. What does that mean? That's the motive why your faith ought to operate out of love. But we're not talking about the motive now. 
We're talking about the faith. And the faith is more important, in other words, to learn about and learn how to operate, it's more important than the love because you actually cannot love people unless you love them by faith. Now, you can love, here's a husband, here's a wife, and they ain't got no problem loving each other. But that's, that's on the natural level. See, there's no problem there. But in, in order to love people as brothers and sisters in Christ, you have to, yeah, uh, you have to love them by faith. Let me finish the statement. You have to love them by faith. Yes, faith does work by a motive of love, but I got news for you. Even though it's not written, love works by faith. Because you stop and think about it. All you got to do, you can prove it to yourself. All you have to do is stop and think about relatives, friends, people you work with, and people you know, they are hard to love. We all know love. Honey, there's some folk hard to like. You, you, I mean, you have a problem just liking them, but forget about loving them. You know what I'm talking about? And so you have to learn how to love by faith. Now, if you don't know how to operate by faith, you'll have challenges. And that's why some of you have challenges in interacting with other Christian brothers and sisters. That's right. Because we all have our personalities. And we all, we, you know, most of the time, all of us are probably trying to be ourselves, but we don't always come off right with other people. Other people don't perceive us the way we're wanting to present ourselves. They think we're, just like with me. I mean, people, they write letters and they think I'm arrogant. Just because I'm, just because I'm confident, just because I know who I am, just because I'm deliberate, just because I'm, I have a purpose in mind and I know what I was called to do, I know what God wants me to do. Well, people take that as arrogance because most people are so mamby-pamby and so wishy-washy and, so, and have such low self-esteem that they're afraid to be that bold. But that's just me, and it has nothing to do with arrogance at all. See what I mean? But that's the way some people perceive me. You follow what I'm saying? Sometimes I talk about material things, and I do it only because it's something you, everybody can relate. Ain't nobody in America cannot relate to automobiles, suits, dresses, shoes, houses, furniture, television sets, jewelry, rings, watches, you know, and I only use it to focus a point, not to be material, because I could be material without saying anything and still be materialistic. That's right. So I'm not materialistic because I talk about material things, and I'm not not materialistic because I don't publicly talk about material things. I could still be materialistic and never say anything about it. Are you following me? But I only use it as an example because that's what all y'all working for. That's what, the only reason you go to work, I'll guarantee you that 99% of you people that are under the sound of my voice here, both in this auditorium and on television, you ain't working and you're not going to go to work tomorrow to a job because you love it. You're going to that job because if you, if you don't go to that job, you're going to starve to death. They're going to pick up your car, repossess your house, and you ain't going to be able to take care of yourself. You ain't working because you love that job. Most of you don't like what you do. I'll guarantee you there's not 10% of the people in this audience this morning that really goes to work to the job you go to just because you love that job so much you can't hardly stay away from it. Uh-uh, you go because you ain't got no choice. You have to work. And you found yourself in that particular kind of, you know, maybe that kind of job or profession. And some, I mean, there are people that have been going to work. They don't like nothing they do. They don't know how to do anything else, so they got to work. So they go to work and hate every minute of it. Now, let me ask this question. Is there anybody that can relate to that? Am I just sitting here blowing in the wind? I know it's true. Are you following me? So when I, when I talk about material things, they write a letter, say, that, you, you, you're too materialistic. See, so I'm talking about perception. So a lot of times, somebody might have a problem loving me just because they think I'm arrogant and they think I'm materialistic. So, but see, you've got to learn to love me by faith. Just like I have to learn to love you by faith with your old chinchy attitude and your old cheapness, see? So we all perceive one another in a different way. So you have to learn how to relate to people by love, see? So that's why I said it's more important than love. I didn't say it was the only thing or that you shouldn't have love, but if you don't know how to operate by faith, then you're going to have a hard time relating to other brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. See what I mean? So you've got to learn to love by faith, if you learn to do that, you'll never have any problem relating to people. 
And that's what some of you do. You, you get into lay, close liaisons with individuals, let's say, in the body of Christ or like in a church setting like this, and you rub, rub up against somebody, and boy, it's just like rubbing up against sandpaper, and you got kind of get to the point where you don't want to talk to that person. You really don't want to see them or, or get into close encounters with them because you don't have an emotional feeling of liking them. But see, you've got to get beyond that. I can't relate to you because I have a feeling or an emotion. I have to do it because God said so. Love ye one another. And if I love you, then I've got to treat you right. But I can't get past your old ugly attitude. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I've got to do that by faith. That's why I say faith is, is important. So tell me something else that's more important. Obedience. How are you going to be obedient without faith? You've got to have faith to be obedient. <laughs> some of you, just like giving your tithe, you've got to have some faith to give away 10% of your income. Talk about obedience. Yeah, God said bring the tithe. Some of you ain't tithing yet. Hmm. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Obedient. How come you ain't tithing? Hmm? Well, when you first tithe, first started, you got to do that by faith. You better have some faith. And that's why a lot of you don't give because you don't have any faith for it. And you saw it took you everything that you could come up with to get them little coins you got, that little chump change that you got. It didn't come easy, and you're not real quick to get up off of it because you're not really sure when you're going to get some more. Come on. I said, come on. I said, talk to me now. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Isn't that right? Because you, it, you, it came hard. I know before I learned how to uh, walk by faith, honey, honey, are you serious? I squeezed the dollar so hard until the ink came off of my hand. <laughs> because it took everything in the world to get the dollar, man. It took me every blood, sweat, and tear, and then didn't get too many dollars after the blood, sweat, and tear. And so my money didn't come quick, it didn't come easy, and it was not easy for me to get up off of it. And almost, almost grudgingly, I would give an offering. I knew I ought to do it. And, you know, I really wanted to do it, but I was torn between these two things of how hard that money came. And I didn't know when I was going to get some more. <laughs> so it's hard. I was holding on to that money, boy. Am I reading anybody's mail? <laughs> uh, am I looking in, in anybody's mailbox here? And so, so I, when I learned how to walk by faith, I mean, just, just think of it. Now, now, again, again, now, always I use illustration just simply to illustrate you, not to brag, because already, I'm already doing what I'm getting ready to tell you about, so telling you ain't going to help what I'm doing. But I do it only because I want you to see the relationship in a real-life situation of what I'm talking about. My wife and I, we give away 25% of all of our income. You've got to have some faith, babe. You shouldn't be getting up off 25% of your stuff unless you've got some faith going for you. Because that's crazy, 25%. Can you imagine what you could do with 25%? I mean, in one year, one particular year, my wife and I gave away $208,000 to the kingdom of God. Now, I didn't, I didn't say that for anybody. So, ooh, ooh. No, no, no. I'm trying to show you. Huh. That takes some faith to give away $200,000. That's, that's all I'm talking about. If you ain't got faith, you're not going to give away $200,000. Some of you ain't never seen $200,000, let alone give it away. It takes you 20 years to make $200,000. But because of the blessings of God, because of having learned 23 years ago how to walk by faith, and we started out giving 10%, then 12%, then 15%, then 20%, and then 25%, because, I, because we love the Lord and because we saw how to work, operate in God's principle, and that's why we have it to give away, because we've been given. So you've got to plant in order to harvest. You can't harvest if you're not planting anything. And the more fields that you plant, the more you're going to have, more crops you've got to harvest. It's not about being able to show off or tell somebody you gave it. It's, it's to have the capacity to be able to do more and be a channel of blessing for the kingdom of God. See, God can speak to me and tell me to give away $10,000 at a time. He can't tell you to do it because you ain't got it. And you'll never have it until you learn how to get in position to get it. We didn't always have it. I stood at the door and watched him repossess the car. No, I didn't have no $10,000 to give away. They would take Jack in the car up and taking it. Huh? So I've been there, but I've also been here. And here is better. I've been there, and I've been here. Here is better. But I have, we had to learn how to do that by faith. Are you following me? They repossessed the car, and I had to file bankruptcy. That's a disgrace for me. I was a Christian. I had to file bankruptcy. Preacher of the gospel. Man of a cloth. 
man of the cloth, and I had to declare bankruptcy. That was an embarrassment for me. Are you following what I'm saying? And so we, once we learn how to walk in the principles of faith, then we found out how to overcome all those things. That's why I say it's the most important thing in the world. So you talk about most important thing to learn once you become a Christian. Understand how I'm saying it now. Because everything else in the kingdom of God is activated by faith. You can't be obedient without faith. I mean, how are you going to obey a God and you can't even see him? Because you ain't doing very well with the folk that are standing in front of you and live in color telling you what to do. You're having challenges with that. Now, how are you going to follow God? You can't even see him. Amen. All right, give me something else. You said obedience. Wis- somebody said wisdom. You've got to have faith to learn how to use wisdom, use it correctly. Huh? Wisdom is the application of knowledge. But you've got to have faith in order to use it to be sure that when you use it, it's going to produce the kind of results that you want. Because once you act in wisdom or exercise wisdom, how do you know it's going to produce what you want? You've got to have faith. And that's the only thing that will frighten away the fear or take away the fear so that you will in confidence be able to exercise your wisdom. All right, talk to me. Give me something else. What? The word. Well, you have to have, you have, to have faith to act on the word. You've never seen God. You've never seen Jesus. How do you know this is true? How do you know it'll work? How do you know that give and it shall be given unto you will work? Fight it, brother. (laughs) I know you're you're visiting with us, but one of the rules that I have here is there's no sleeping in the auditorium. Okay, so I'm not trying to put this... You know, put you on the spot, but what we're dealing here with is with life. It's very important. It's too important to sleep on. And if you're sleepy, the best, really, the best thing to do is just go on outside and go to sleep. See, because you're not gonna get that. You don't get points just for coming. That's right, amen. Okay, so I, I'm only saying that just to encourage you. See, I usually have something I do, and people sleep on me. And if I see it again, then I'll have, I will do that. But I'm gonna give you, a, I'm gonna give you mercy this time because I know you don't know. All right, what you laughing about? <laughs> I watch you sleeping too under that hat. That's why she wear that big hat. <laughs> so she can sleep, act like I don't know. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Okay. So wor- the word, you can't act on the word. You can't be a doer of the word. That's why some people, isn't that interesting? Now think about it. Why is it that some, that, that some Christians, even in this congregation, some Christians have greater results with the word than others? We all got the same Bible. And the Bible says God is no respecter of persons. So he can't be blessed in just because it's me or just because it's you. But maybe it's possible that because I have more faith in operation that I'm able to apply it more evenly and consistently to the word of God to produce the kind of result. Because if you were doing it the same way I was doing it, you would be producing the same results that I'm producing. That's the point. So, what else? How come everybody that's making, how come everybody that's giving me these things that way back in the back, <laughs> I can't even hear them? Faith and patience. Faith and patience together. No, you have to operate, you have to operate, no, you have to operate in patience by faith. But they, but, 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 but you do have patience that goes along with faith, but you got to have the faith or you ain't got nothing to put the patience with. Prayer, prayer, that's one of the most important things you've got to have faith. How do you know how do you know a God that you can't see is going to answer what you just asked? <laughs> right? You're praying to somebody you can't even see. How do you know God heard you? How do you know God's going to answer you? Well, of course, his word says so, but you have to have faith in his word to believe that he is there and that he will hear you and will answer you. So you've got to have faith. That's why some people's prayers don't do too much. That's why my prayers in years gone by didn't do very much. That's how come I got into bankruptcy and I got into all them repossessing all the stuff they repossessed because I did not know how to pray because I didn't have any faith in operation. See, I had faith, but I didn't know I had it because my church didn't teach me that I had it. And so I didn't know how to use it. So I was just going on my supposed smarts, and my smarts weren't too smart, evidently, because <laughs> the folks came and got the stuff. <laughs> I mean, they came and got it. You know what I'm saying? So, I, but now I absolutely know 
Now, see, again, here's, the, here's perception. When I say what I'm getting ready to say, somebody will write me a letter, or somebody will say, oh, my God, there he goes again, bragging again, and they're missing the whole thing. I'm just, I'm not bragging. I'm just confident. I've been walking in it for 23 years. Look like I ought to get somewhere along the line where I got some confidence in something after 23 years. You know, I mean, I'm kind of dumb if I say, I don't know if God will hear me or not. I mean, I mean, I've been praying for 23 years, walking in this for 23 years, and at the end of 23 years, I'm telling, God, I wonder if God's going to hear me. Uh, do you think God will hear me? Oh. No, so it's not arrogance, it's confidence. I've been doing this for so long. I mean, are you arrogant when you go stick the key in your ignition of your car if you've had your car for any length of time? I've had my car for eight years. I'm, that's not arrogance. I'm confident. I've been doing it. The thing has never failed in eight years to start when I put the key in. Not one time has my car ever failed to start when I put the key in it. Never had a rundown battery in eight years. Nothing ever. I put the key, and so it's not arrogant. I'm confident. Amen. But I'm confident only by experience. Amen. Amen. What else? Hope. Well, you got to have faith to operate in hope because what makes you think hope's going to produce anything? See what I mean? You got to. That's the only thing that gives you hope. Some substance, and we're going to get into that, is your faith. Because hope without faith will never come to pass. Now, now the hope is great. You've got to have hope. But hope is just a goal setter. Hope sets goals, but faith goes and gets it. See, if you don't, you, you got to have a, you have to have a goal. But suppose you have a goal and have no way to get it. I mean, what good would it do you stand on the, the south rim of the Grand Canyon and look across a mile and a half to the north rim of the Grand Canyon and they have $25 trillion worth of greenbacks stacked up in a big pile over there on the north rim and you ain't got no way to get across that mile and a half to get it. What good does that do you? None. You got to have a bridge to get across there, some way to get across there, right? And you could be thinking about all that that $26 trillion could do for you, but if you can't get to it, it's not going to do anything for you. Are you following? So you got to have hope, but you got to have faith to go get the hope. See, all that hope will do is let you smile while the ship is sinking, but faith will keep the ship afloat. That's the difference. See, you got to have hope so that your faith will have something to go and get. But if all you have is the hope, yeah, you can smile while the ship is sinking, then man, show me some way to keep the ship afloat. And that's what faith will do. All right, anybody else? Life. Life, that's the biggest thing in the world you have to have faith for. Sure, life. Don't, all right, let me show you. Don't you have faith? When you go to bed at night, don't you have some faith that you're going to wake up in the morning? Because if you weren't, if you didn't have some faith that you were going to wake up, you wouldn't go to bed. You'd stay awake all night. Okay, let me go on. See, you can't, you can't stump me. See, you can't do it. Faith, I'm talking about for the child of God, for the Christian, once you get saved, once you become a Christian, the most important thing for you to learn about is how to walk by faith, how to live by faith, because everything else in the kingdom of God is going to be activated and accessed by your faith. That's why it's so important. I mean, the most important thing relative to language, speaking, talking, and reading is the alphabet. If you don't have an alphabet, how are you going to write? So you've got to have the alphabet before you can do the writing. Got to be an alphabet. You've got to know the alphabet. You don't know it, you can't write, because all words are composed of alphabets. Huh? All languages composed of alphas. You've got to have alphas. So you've got to have the basics in order to write and understand. Are you, are you following the, uh, the way I'm going? So it's like that with the kingdom of God. Faith is like the alphabet. If you've got the faith, then you can do all the rest of the things that are involved. But if you don't have your faith operating, you're going to end up stumbling around, and you're not going to be able to do things that God would have you to do on the highest level. You'll survive, but who wants survival? I want victory myself. Yeah. Not just survival. <laughs> hey, I was surviving before I came to Christ. <laughs> I mean, if I'm going to come to him and all I'm going to do is continue to survive, you know. So that's why I say it's, it's the most important subject 
to learn and master once you're born again. Nothing else is as important. Only because everything else is going to be, I said it before, but I want to say it again, is going to be activated, in other words, put into operation by your faith. So if my faith is little, anemic, and inoperative, then I'm not going to be able to put very much into op operation. I'm not going to be able to activate very much in the kingdom of God. Can you understand that? So that's why it's so important. And that's why God has committed to me this emphasis. There, there are different emphasis that God gives to different ministries, you know, and different ministers. We're not supposed to be just carbon copies of everybody else. You know, we should do some of the things. And I've done that. I talked the last series was about what God hates. We ought to hate it too, right? So I, well, I teach on a lot of other things. But this, this, is like the, this is like the thread. Faith, let me give you a definition. Faith, faith is the thread of the fabric of the Word of God. Faith is the thread of the fabric of the Word of God and of the Christian life. If you don't have thread, you can't make material. All these garments that we have on are the result of thread. Is that right? Because sometimes if you, you can make a mistake and do something dumb and end up having a ravel and start pulling on that ravel and the thread starts and the whole thing comes apart. Isn't that right? So faith is the thread of the fabric of the Word of God. See? And the more threads you have, the more garments you All can right. make. Amen. The more faith you have in operation, the more you can do in the kingdom of God. See? So it's very, very important. It's not the only subject, but it's the most important one. Once you are born again, then you need to learn how to walk by faith. Okay? He's just resting his eyes. All right, Romans chapter 1. Have you found it yet? If you didn't find Romans chapter 1, just, you know, I mean, trade your Bible in. Do, you know, you'll never find it. Now, the first thing I want to do, I've told you about it, but now I want to give you scriptural support just to show you how important faith is. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Everybody read, please. Okay, maybe you didn't hear me. Romans chapter 1. Okay, Romans... Well, it sounded like maybe you weren't there yet. So Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Everybody read, please. Now, this verse shows us the overwhelming importance of faith. Notice what it says. It said, the just shall live by faith. Now, the word just, J-U-S-T, you'll see this word in the Bible. You'll see the word justification, which is the derivative of this. You'll see the word justify. All those words basically mean declared righteous declared righteous. So we could read it like this. For therein is the righteousness. He is talking about righteousness, see. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, those who have been declared righteous shall live by faith. And every person that's born again, every individual that has accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, God declares you righteous. You don't have any righteousness of your own. You are not righteous of and by yourself, but God certifies or declares you righteous. Now, because you are, you should live by faith. Therefore, faith becomes a way of living. Yes. Now, if you're supposed to live by it, you need to understand it thoroughly in order to live. Amen. And that's why so many people have challenges with life. I mean, with little things, keeps them hung up and strung out because they don't know how to relate in life. But the just, those that have been declared righteous, we're supposed to live by faith. So that means then that faith is not, a, is not a magic wand that you wave over the issues of life. Faith is not an Aladdin's lamp that you rub it and say, genie, genie, go get me a yacht. 
Faith, faith is not a parachute that you use to bail out of the issues of life. Faith is a way of living. It's the lifestyle of God. Amen. The just shall live. Now, how can you live by something you don't even know how it works? Could that possibly be why some of you are having such challenges in life? Because your knowledge and understanding of the principles of faith is so shallow that you're not able to apply it to the issues of your life to produce the kind of results that God wants you to have or that you should have in your life. I mean, marriage folk going around and fussing and fighting and fuming and kicking each other and going through all this mess. We spend more time with marital counseling sessions. It's so stupid and ignorant, all because of selfishness and ignorance in terms of what they ought to be doing in their marriage relationship. Christians filled with the Spirit, got the Bible, and having problems in marriage. Boy, that didn't go over too well. Glory to God, man. I, I must have... I must have pressed the right button that time. I mean, I thought, I thought if I had closed my eyes, Jimmy, I would have thought everybody left the auditorium and got so quiet, bro. Hey, what's happening here, y'all? Y'all still here? You still here, brother? All right. So the just shall live by faith. So that means that faith is a way of living. Now, let me ask you a question. You'll, you thought you'll see again how important this subject is. Let me ask you a question. It says the just shall live by faith. How often on a daily basis should you live? You didn't get that one? You didn't get that? Want me to say that again? Yeah. I said on a daily basis. See, it says the just shall live by faith. I said that faith is a way of life. It's a way of living. It's the God kind of life. So I asked the question, just to dramatize again how important faith is, I asked the question, how much or how often on a daily basis should you live? Exactly. All the time, huh? Every, every minute of the day. Well, then that means you ought to have faith in operation every minute of the day because the just shall live by faith. Got that? Yeah. All right. That's the first scripture that I'll use as an indi indicator of the importance of faith. All right, let's go to 1 Timothy. Now, <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 6, the first part of the 12th verse, I want everyone to read up to the word faith, including the word faith, but that's as far as you read. Everybody read. Again. One more time. All right, you got it now. Just look at me and say it. God didn't say, fight the good fight. He's very specific. He says, fight the good fight of faith. So if God tells us to fight the good fight of faith, then that tells me that I am in a fight. We are in a battle. And I think that sometimes Christians miss the point of understanding what they ought to be fighting, so they end up fighting other brothers and sisters, fighting other churches, fighting ministers, even trying to fight the devil and demons. And nowhere in the Bible does God ever tell us to fight Satan. Never, ever. The only fight, the only fight that you should be involved in is the faith fight. Yes. Now notice he said fight the good fight. Why does he say good? The reason he says good is because we win. Yes. The fight is only a good one when I win. Yes. Isn't that right? That's right. Yes. Think about it. We, see, God knows human nature. So when he writes things in the word, it's not just all about technicalities, but it's also about him knowing how we think. And it's always a good, it was a good fight if our man won. It was a good game if our team won. If our team didn't win, wasn't there a good game? Especially if they really get wiped out. 
Now, if it's a close one, you know, 9 to 10, the score is 9 to 10, then we say, well, that was a good game, even though we lost. But ordinarily, it's always a good game when we win, bad game when we lost. So God says fight the good fight. He didn't say fight the fight of faith. He said fight the good one because God wants you to win. And he's given you everything to win with, but you've got to know how to use it. You've got to know how to marshal all the resources that God has provided, put them into operation in your life, and utilize them. A lot of you getting your behinds kicked. Okay? I mean, you're getting your backside kicked. Life is kicking you. Huh? Whipping your head. Putting knots on your head. Beating up on you. I know it did me. It turned me every way but loose. I mean, every way but... I got kicked going, and then when I turned around to see who kicked me on this side, I got kicked on that side, and then I turned around to see... But I got kicked again. I mean, it was, it was wearing me out because I didn't know how to operate by the principles that God had revealed in his word because the church I went to didn't tell me anything about that. All they said was, hold on to God's unchanging hand. I'm not trying to be funny. That's what they said. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. Let go and let God. Boy, doesn't that sound spiritual? Let go and let God. Hey, let go of what? I didn't have nothing. <laughs> and let God do what? <laughs> let go. Let go of what? I was trying to get something. I didn't have nothing to let go of. We had these cliches, and they don't help you, really. That's my point. Okay? I'm not knocking it, but it's, it's pointless, worthless. It's not going to do you any good. I was getting destroyed. My life was being destroyed because I did not know. But he said, fight the good fight of faith. I didn't know I was in a fight. Now, I understand if there's a fight to faith, then there must be some enemies to faith. Because if there were no enemies, there wouldn't be anything to fight about. Now, Satan, listen to this carefully. Satan, the devil. And for the benefit of some of you esoteric thinking people, there is actually a personage known as Satan and the devil. He's not a cartoon character. The guy with the red suit and the horns and a pitchfork and a tail. I wished it were true that that was all there was to it. But he's a spiritual personage, very powerful, not all powerful, and he is out to gun you down. He's out to blow you away. Now, he can't do it without your cooperation. But you see, you can cooperate out of ignorance and not realize that you're doing That's what I was doing, and I didn't know it. I, well, I, didn't, I wasn't asking no, the devil to kick my, you know, knock me out, beat up on me. But because I, of ignorance, I was destroyed for a lack of knowledge, see? That's a biblical principle. Didn't have the knowledge, see? And so the devil was taking advantage of me. Now, Satan is, as far as a personal entity, he is the enemy, okay, and his demons that are his assistants. However, our fight is not with them, and they, Satan and demons, are really not interested in you as a person. You are a cipher. You are a zero. You are nothing. I am nothing. We mean nothing to Satan. There's only one thing about us that Satan is interested in. He's not interested in your money. He's not interested in taking away your health. He's not interested in separating your family. He's not interested in trying to get your car or try to rob you out of a job. The only thing that Satan is interested in you is your faith. And I'm going to show you this in a moment. That's all. Now, he'll come against your physical body, but it's not because he wants your body. What's he going to do with it if he gets it? Kind of like the dog, you know, the fire truck or the ambulance driving down the street. You ever seen that? The ambulance driving down the street. Here comes this little old dog out from behind somebody's house. And just chasing the thing and running right up by the wheel of the thing and barking. What's he going to do if he got the ambulance? What's he going to do with it? He can't drive. Stupid dog. What's he going to do with the fire truck? I mean, he, can't, he don't know how to hold a fire hose. Are you following me? So we have to understand 
that Satan is not interested in you, but just in your faith. That's all that's important. Now, nowhere in the Bible does it ever tell us to fight the devil. Number one, the reason that it tells us not to, doesn't tell us to fight him is because he has already been fought and been whipped. Amen. He is a defeated foe. But he doesn't want you to know it so that he can continue to lord it over you. So he will take advantage of the average Christian's ignorance about his existence and his purpose and beat up on them, and they think God's doing it to make a better person out of them. So the devil wins going away. The Bible never says to fight the devil. Mark chapter 16, the Bible says, These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out. Yes. Now in the King James it says devils, but it's literally demons. It says they shall cast them out. It didn't say anything about fight them. It just cast them out. That means throw them out. Throw them out. But you can't do that if you don't know how. Amen. And you can't do that if you don't know you can. Amen. Then Luke said in, uh, Jesus said in Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. And the enemy is Satan. And the words scorpions are just uh, uh, um, a synonym for demons, Satan and demons. And Jesus said, Behold, I give unto you a power, meaning actually authority, right or privilege, to walk on. He didn't say anything about fight him. He'd walk on them. So they ought to be under your feet. Yes. Not on your head. Uh, he said, he said, walk on. I've given you authority to walk on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Then James 4, 7 says, submit yourself therefore unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you didn't say anything about fight. He just simply said resist him. But you can't do the resisting until you've submitted yourself to God. And the way you submit yourself to God is by submitting yourself to his word. If you submit yourself to his word, then you are submitted to God. You have a right to resist the devil, and he has to flee. But that might be why the devil ain't been fleeing from some of you. You've been talking to him, but he's just been still eating up on you and whipping up on you because you're not submitted to the word. You're not doing the word, see. Are you following me? Then in Ephesians 4.27, Paul says, neither give place to the devil. Yes. Didn't say fight him, said don't give him any place. Amen. But one thing he did do is to say quit when you're out of time. Isn't that amazing how fast that time went? Well, stay right where you are. I'm not finished. We're getting ready to launch out on something that's going to be a blessing to you. So stay right where you are. If this message has been a blessing to you, the announcer will tell you some very important information about how you may obtain an audio cassette of the message which you've just heard for your own spiritual enrichment and edification. Remember again that these telecasts and radio broadcasts are made possible by the continued free will offerings of you, the viewers, and listeners. Remember also these words from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. This program is now available to you on compact disc or DVD. CD copies are available for any amount. DVD copies are available for your love gift of $15 or more for the ongoing support of this ministry. Call the number on your screen or write to Dr. Frederick A.C. Price, Box 90,000, Los Angeles, California, 90009. Indicate the number you see on your screen and join us again on Ever Increasing Faith.